As a college student at Holy Cross, Clarence Thomas excelled at his studies, found a hero in Malcolm X, and found his voice in campus debates. But there was one area where he lagged way behind. I came to the conclusion that he didn't know women at all. Eddie Jenkins was a football star at Holy Cross and one of Clarence's closest friends. And then, you know, when he told me he was going to be a priest and so what happened in the priesthood, and I realized, okay, all right, this brother, he had no experience. Eddie wanted to help Clarence. The trouble was, finding women to date was a major challenge for black men at Holy Cross. They were stuck at a mostly white, all-male school, and the closest women's colleges were almost all white, too. The white folks had this thing called a mixer. And that was all white people getting together, drinking beer with loud, crazy music. That was not for me and a lot of the brothers. It wasn't just the music. Holy Cross's Black Student Union included this line in its statement of principles. The black man does not want or need the white woman. Like other members of the BSU, Clarence Thomas strongly disapproved of interracial dating. Although Thomas did have a white roommate, he thought relationships should be governed by different rules. At Holy Cross, he told his black friends that they had a special responsibility to defend black women. And I remember that Clarence even wrote a poem and pinned it on some of the walls. Is you is or is you ain't a brother? And it was saying that, you know, as a brother, you have to protect the dignity of these sisters. So that's who Eddie Jenkins was trying to help. A guy with no experience, few options, and extremely strong opinions. But Eddie did what he could for Clarence and other lonely students. On the weekends, they'd all pile inside a borrowed station wagon and roll into Boston. It'd probably be overpacked, you know, with, with brothers. You almost had to buy a ticket to get on, and I was the conductor. One of those weekends, in 1969, Eddie invited a woman named Kathy Ambush to meet up with him for dinner. She was a freshman at a nearby Catholic school and the daughter of a local Black family. They were just nice people. And so she became my friend, but she wasn't for me. I knew that she might have been thinking about me, but sometimes as a friend, you know, you got to make a referral. The friend who got that referral was Clarence Thomas. Going to the dinner, she and I rode in the car in the back together. But after the dinner, they two, they started hitting off and talking. And going home, she and he rode together in the back. Eddie suspected that his plan was working, but he didn't get to catch up with Clarence until a few weeks later when they ran into each other on campus. So he takes him into the stairwell. He has that real serious look on his face. He says, Jenks, he said, you know that girl you introduced me? I said, you mean Kathy? He said, yeah. He said, um, Jenks, I think I'm in love. I said, in love? How do you know? He says, man, because I've had diarrhea for a week. I said, diarrhea? I said, man, I ain't going to never be in love. I said, but, but, but hey, hey, you keep on crapping, brother. You keep on crapping, man. I'll see you later. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Clarence Thomas got over his nerves quickly. He married Kathy Ambush the day after he graduated from Holy Cross. At 22 years old, Clarence had gotten a handle on his personal life. And his professional life? He had big plans for that, too. This is Slow Burn. I'm your host, Joel Anderson. In 1971, Clarence Thomas was enrolling at one of the country's most prestigious institutions, Yale Law School. After he got his degree, he was going to go back to Savannah, Georgia as a civil rights attorney so he could right the racial wrongs of his hometown. At least, that was the plan. But when Thomas got to Yale Law, it all fell apart. He felt like everything he did was under scrutiny, that the people at Yale thought he was only there because he was Black. This was the paradox for Clarence Thomas. Racial preferences gave him a leg up. They also made him feel degraded. But in the 1970s, Thomas would find a group of people who accepted him and who helped sharpen his political beliefs. Did Clarence Thomas benefit from affirmative action or did it hold him back? What did he get from white conservatives? And what did they get from him? And how did attacking his own family make him a rising star in the Republican Party? If you have a deeply cynical view of white people, 
you start to calculate what is it necessary for me to do in order to get what I want. This is episode two, Smiling Faces. This episode is brought to you by SAP. Welcome to the window, the window of opportunity, when your next move can either make your business famous or obsolete. So you need to be ready. Be handling good surprises and bad ones ready. Be opening a Portland, Houston, and Providence location on the same day ready. Be stock options plus paid family leave ready. SAP has been there and can help you be ready for anything that happens next. Because it will. Be ready with SAP. There's no denying that the education system in America has its flaws. It's time to work toward a better system, one where business and politics don't drive the decisions made in schools. Check out the brand new podcast, The Citizen Steward Show. It's an inside look at the dark forces affecting our schools and our democracy, and how together we can make improvements for our kids and our country. The Citizen Steward Show is hosted by Chris Stewart, a parent, education activist, and former school board member who's witnessed the systemic inequities in our schools firsthand. Each week, he and co-host Ravi Gupta, a former Obama staffer and school superintendent, dive deep into the top headlines that aren't being covered. They share an inside look at the perils and promise of education and democracy in America, with no topics off limits. Join the conversation with The Citizen Steward Show every Tuesday on the Branch Podcast Network. You can find The Citizen Steward Show on Amazon, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or wherever you get your shows. Judge Thomas, I bring this subject up not to uh, cause you personal concern, but because it's uh, become part of the debate over your nomination. The question is directly in entry to Yale. Were you part of an affirmative action quota? Were you part of a racial quota in terms of entering that law school? Um, Senator, I have uh, not during my adult life or during my academic career been a part of any quota. At his Supreme Court confirmation hearing, Clarence Thomas said that affirmative action can undermine the self-esteem and self-respect of the people it's supposedly helping. But when he got to Yale Law School 20 years earlier, it was still a fairly new solution to a very old problem. The question of opportunity and employment has long been on the minds of Black people. Leah Wright Rigueur teaches history at Johns Hopkins University and is the author of The Loneliness of the Black Republican. But it's really not until the administration of John F. Kennedy, where Kennedy passes an executive order basically saying we're going to have a committee on equal employment opportunity. It ought to be possible, therefore, for every American to enjoy the privileges of being American without regard to his race or his color. JFK was the first president to call for affirmative action in the modern sense of the term. His successor, Lyndon Johnson, tried to make that bold idea into the law of the land. This is the next and the more profound stage of the battle for civil rights. We seek not just freedom, but opportunity. But Johnson's affirmative action proposal was mired in controversy and ultimately got scrapped so it dies. But it's resurrected under a Republican president, and that is Richard Nixon. And it introduces something that is so fundamentally different from anything we have done in the United States before this, which is that it says positive discrimination is okay if it's rectifying a historical wrong. One of the main proponents of positive discrimination was Nixon's assistant secretary of labor, He was a Black Republican named Arthur Fletcher. He's known as the father of affirmative action. I was able to convince Nixon that quality human capital is a national security issue and has very little or nothing to do with social justice. He understood that. He says this is a way that we create Black mobility, Black social mobility, and Black wealth. Arthur Fletcher was focused on getting government contractors to hire more minority workers. But affirmative action wouldn't be limited to the public sector. 
private organizations see the writing on the wall and begin to institute their own version of affirmative action. One of those organizations was Yale Law School. Yale Law created its first explicit affirmative action program in 1971. It was designed to set minority enrollment at about 10% of the incoming class. The purpose was what now goes under the rubric of diversity, that it would be better for Yale Law School to have some representation of minority students. That's Neil Lewis. He's a former reporter for the New York Times. It was kind of controversial. There were incidents I'd learned of professors speaking out against it because they thought it damaged the brand, but they, they went along with it. Clarence Thomas got accepted to Yale at this exact moment. During his Supreme Court confirmation hearing, Thomas said that he believed he'd earned his spot at Yale and hadn't received any special treatment due to his race. Uh, the effort on the part of Yale during my years there was to reach out and open its doors to minorities whom it felt were qualified. Uh, and I took them uh, at their word on that. What Thomas said in 1991 isn't wrong. Yale did open its doors to minority students that it felt were qualified. But Neil Lewis's reporting that same year uncovered the whole truth. Yale did evaluate Black applicants like Thomas separately, and they did get special consideration. His identity was he abhorred affirmative action, and he spoke about it many, many times. And yet uh, here he was the beneficiary of it. Exactly how much Thomas benefited from affirmative action is hard to say. He got admitted to Holy Cross thanks to his good grades and a recommendation from a nun, and maybe in part because the school was actively looking for black students. Then, in 1971, he got accepted to multiple law schools. One of them was Harvard, which had just adopted a race-conscious admissions policy. Thomas had once fantasized about going to Harvard Law. But when it came time to choose, he decided on Yale because he thought it would be a better fit for his liberal politics. Thomas was one of 12 black students in the first year class of 175. Yale had a reputation as a proving ground for the academic elite, a place that counted seven Supreme Court justices among its former students. And when Thomas got there, he started to question whether he belonged. The demands at Yale Law School were intense. That's Corey Robin. He's the author of The Enigma of Clarence Thomas. This is somebody who had been able through a combination of intelligence and hard work, uh, been able to do quite well, and suddenly it wasn't cutting it. Most days, he would get up before dawn, go to class, and study until he fell asleep. He also worked 15 hours a week at a legal clinic. But no matter how hard he tried, it didn't feel like it would ever be good enough. During his time at Yale, a member of the law school's admissions committee told a group of black students that none of them were qualified to be there. It was like sort of taking all the air out of the balloon. You're not here because of you, Clarence Thomas. You're not here because of your family. You're not here because of the black community. You're here because of us, white people. When I went to high school and college in the 90s, I heard the same stuff Clarence Thomas heard a generation before, how I was only there because of affirmative action. The history professor, Leah Wright Rigueur, got that too. A girl in my high school, my graduating high school class, who was very, very nice, right? I thought we were cool. Came up to me and was like, you only got into Dartmouth because you're Black. The insinuation is that you don't belong there and that you're not smart enough to be there. Yeah, absolutely. That's the that's the where the cynicism comes in, right? Or, or the maybe it's fatalism. I don't know what it is, but it's just like there's no use crying about it because no matter what I do, you're going to doubt it, right? You know, I graduated with honors, killed it, like did everything quote unquote right. I even got like person of the year for my class, my graduating class from Target. Damn, man. I know. I was like, I I was little overachiever. I overheard someone say, well, she only did that because she's Black. So it made me realize it didn't matter what I did. Thomas had thought of Holy Cross as a middle-class school full of strivers, peers he could relate to even if they didn't look like him. At Yale, he was surrounded by children of privilege, a good number of them legacy admissions. Some of those classmates would become his friends. 
He was part of a regular lunchtime crew at a Yale dining hall, the guy with the big lion's roar laugh. He'd regale his fellow students with stories about the pornographic movies he went to see in downtown New Haven. But in his memoir, Thomas focused on the isolation he felt, the hours he spent by himself guzzling blackberry brandy and listening to Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. His wife Kathy Ambush had dropped out of college and was working as a bank teller to help pay their rent. Money got even tighter during his second year at Yale when she gave birth to a son. They named him Jamal. So he had all kinds of, you know, family pressures and obligations that he was thinking about. And he was young, remember, you know, when he's taking this all on. The summer after Jamal was born, Thomas went to work for one of the most prominent civil rights attorneys in Savannah. This was the only job he'd wanted, the one that would allow him to right the racial wrongs he'd seen growing up in the Deep South. But the lawyer he worked for in Savannah drank more than he worked. And instead of righting racial wrongs, Thomas found himself killing time in the library. It's possible that Clarence Thomas's life might have turned out differently if he'd had a better experience that summer. Regardless, he gave up on being a civil rights lawyer pretty quickly. Back at Yale, Thomas started interviewing with big city firms. He figured he'd get a bunch of lucrative job offers, but as his classmates zoomed off to start their careers, Thomas heard no after no after no. Years later, he said he held on to all of those rejection letters. I'd done everything I was supposed to do and I couldn't get a job. You know, I had a kid and I had a wife, I had student loans. I was frustrated and I was very upset. Thomas began to suspect that those top law firms doubted his qualifications. What good was a Yale law degree if everyone who mattered thought it was tainted by affirmative action? After Thomas finished up in New Haven, he stuck a 15-cent cigar sticker on his diploma. To him, that's all it was worth. In his memoir, Thomas mentioned another Motown record he listened to during this period. Smiling Faces Sometimes was by a group called The Undisputed Truth. Smiling faces sometimes pretend to be your friend. You know, the title tells you what the song is about, and he'd play this over and over again. Thomas felt Northern whites were hypocritical. They looked down at Southern racists while having similar attitudes themselves. To him, the smiling faces that don't tell the truth belong to some of the white liberals at Yale. The song's message was just like Malcolm X's warning about the wolf and the fox. I think there are many whites who act friendly toward Negroes. A fox acts friendly toward the lamb. The wolf bears its teeth and its fangs. The fox seems, you know, sweeter and cuter and friendlier, but is no uh, less lethal. Liberal, white, seemingly benevolent, people who are also, you know, ready to stick a knife in your back. When I spoke with Leah Wright Rigueur, we talked about where those feelings of betrayal can lead. Like Clarence Thomas goes through this system, just like a lot of us do, you know, in majority white spaces, and you don't like how it feels. And then you come to the realization that like, well, man, I don't have any faith that white people are ever going to change or ever going to be serious about ameliorating the effects of racism. So I might as well get mine. And that must be really seductive. I mean, a lot of times when we look at these spaces as radicalizing spaces for Black people to become more revolutionary, to become more progressive, right? But if having an experience in predominantly white spaces, particularly a, a traumatic experience, can radicalize you to the left, then it certainly can radicalize you to the right. We'll be back in a minute. This episode is brought to you by Saatchi Art, where you can shop original artwork by the world's top emerging artists right from your home. Just like the enduringly relevant history we talk about on Slow Burn, art has this incredible ability to be a product of its own time and maker, while also being timeless and universal. 
For more than a decade, Saatchi Art and their team of experts have helped art enthusiasts around the world discover art they love. From one-of-a-kind abstracts and gorgeous landscape paintings, to sculptures, photographs, and much more. Saatchi Art has artworks from thousands of emerging artists around the globe. So you're guaranteed to find art that fits your style, space, and budget. And Saatchi Art takes care of everything. You'll enjoy hassle-free delivery and a seven-day money-back guarantee. Slowburn listeners get 10% off their first order with code SLATE. Just go to SaatchiArt.com and enter SLATE at checkout. That's S-A-A-T-C-H-I art.com code SLATE. Discover one-of-a-kind art you love today and support emerging artists around the world. Go to SaatchiArt.com. In the early 70s, Clarence Thomas was on track to receive an Ivy League diploma that to him seemed totally worthless. He had a young family to take care of, no solid job offers, and a lot of student loan debt. Politically, he identified as a Democrat, voting for George McGovern in 1972 instead of Richard Nixon. By the end of the decade, Thomas would find himself in a very different place. He'd be a rising star, a black conservative who'd found his place in a mostly white ideological revolution. In some ways, Clarence Thomas legitimately changed in the 1970s. He met new people and got introduced to new ideas. But he also began to feel more comfortable admitting what he'd always believed. Thomas's flirtation with the right started with a friend he met at Yale Law School. You may have heard of him. He'd go on to become Donald Trump's national security advisor. We had a lot of conversations because we ended up in married student housing. He was on one floor and I was on the floor above him. John Bolton and Clarence Thomas met each other totally by chance when Bolton found Thomas's lost wallet. I mean, this is purely providential or serendipity. I had been told, you know, he was this bad Republican and uh, conservative, and we started talking. One time, Thomas was arguing the liberal position on automotive safety, that it was perfectly fine for the government to force people to wear seatbelts. Bolton told him he was a fool. You know, why would you trust this state that has done so many things to black people, bad things? Corey Robert again. Why would you trust this state to protect you? Isn't that something you need to think about? Thomas did think about it. Bolton's argument reminded him of what his grandfather, Myers Anderson, said about public assistance. If you go on welfare, the government can ask you questions about your life that are none of their business. In his autobiography, Thomas wrote that Bolton and his grandfather were making the same point. Real freedom meant independence from government intrusion. That was a conservative idea, but Thomas still didn't think of himself as a conservative. Then he met John Danforth. I knew that he was able, smart. As I recall, he had very good recommendations from Yale faculty I knew. In 1974, Danforth was the Republican Attorney General for the state of Missouri. He was also a Yale Law alum. But all that mattered to Clarence Thomas was that Danforth was hiring. It was a very small office with an immense caseload. We just had a ton of work to do. And the only way to do that successfully is to hire young lawyers. Thomas claims that at this point, he still couldn't imagine working for a Republican. But after getting rejected by the country's top law firms, he didn't have any other options. I offered him a job, and I told him at the time, I will <laughs> give you more work and less pay than anybody else interviewing at Yale Law School. I asked Danforth if he hired Clarence Thomas, at least in part because of his race. My ambition was that the AG's office was to be the best law office in the state. Now, did I also think that it was important to have a diverse office? Yes, I did. And did I think that it would be wonderful to hire Clarence Thomas for that reason? Yes. But the most important reason was I had to get the job done. Just to dig down on that for a second, why did you think it was important? I think it's important that an office be a model of decency and fairness. And we are certainly not going to discriminate and we want to be an open place. Once again, Thomas found himself surrounded by white peers. 
When he came to Missouri in August 1974, he became the only black lawyer on the attorney general staff. But this time, he felt totally at ease. He became a regular at after-work drinks and joined a weekly basketball game at the Highway Patrol gym. He was certainly among the most popular people in the office. I mean, he's the opposite of some stuffed shirt, big deal guy. At work, Thomas was looking to prove that he had more to offer than his blackness. Just a year earlier, he'd wanted to be a civil rights attorney. Now, he asked not to be given any race-related assignments. Even so, he waded into office debates about affirmative action and welfare, and his opinions made a big impression. Several of his co-workers believed he was the most conservative lawyer on staff. Thomas also loved talking about books. One of his favorites was Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead, about the redemptive power of market capitalism. That novel confirmed his belief that even if he felt alone in his views, that didn't mean he was wrong. Throughout the centuries, there were men who took first steps down new roads, armed with nothing but their own vision. He later showed the movie version to each new class of clerks at the Supreme Court. Every new thought was opposed, but the men of unborrowed vision went ahead. They fought, they suffered, and they paid, but they won. When Thomas was living in Missouri, an old friend from Savannah came to town for a visit. That friend had known Thomas as a liberal, but now he found Thomas talking up Republicans, saying that black people need to be on both sides. He also noticed that Thomas had taken down his old Malcolm X poster. In its place was a giant picture of a Rolls Royce. By the mid-70s, Clarence Thomas had a better sense of what he believed. He was also making the kinds of connections that would allow him to move up in the world. In 1976, his mentor John Danforth got elected to the U.S. Senate, and with the help of Danforth's recommendation, Thomas landed a lucrative corporate gig. He gets a job with Monsanto, which is a powerful Missouri-based company that at the time was looking to hire black attorneys. That's lawyer Scott Stern. He wrote about Thomas's time at the giant chemical company for the Harvard Environmental Law Review. And so he joins Monsanto and immediately doubles his salary. And he's actually making more money than uh, most of the attorneys at big firms in St. Louis. So this is a big, big step up for him in terms of wealth. When Thomas started at Monsanto, environmental activists were protesting the company's toxic chemicals. Government regulators were also nosing around, asking all kinds of probing questions. And the Monsanto legal department was firing back. This was not just a company defending itself. This was a company on a crusade. Monsanto was bringing lawsuits left and right. Monsanto was defending itself in multi-billion dollar class actions. Thomas joined this company at a moment when it was on the warpath. And that, of course, influenced him. John Bolton said it about seatbelts. His grandfather said it about welfare. Now he was hearing it at Monsanto. Real freedom meant independence from government intrusion. Thomas spent a couple of years at Monsanto. Then, Senator Danforth came calling from Washington, D.C. Danforth was, again, looking to diversify his staff. And Clarence Thomas was just the guy for the job. And for the next two years, he handles energy, environmental, and public works matters for the senator, advising him on legislation in all these areas. Scott Stern says Thomas became a kind of middleman, a go-between for his old corporate bosses and Republican political leaders. Thomas was a really reliable and receptive listener to industry complaints. He was frequently in contact with people from the chemical industry, and in particular from Monsanto, and he would convey their talking points directly to Danforth. Thomas's partnership with John Danforth is one he'd replicate in the years that followed, a mutually beneficial relationship with a rich and powerful white Republican. In the 1970s, he would also connect with another influential conservative. But this one wasn't a politician, and he wasn't white. Black people have never supported, for example, affirmative action. So it is not a question of what black people chose to do. It's what you, you choose to put in the mouths of black people. It's what you choose to, to project. Thomas Sowell would become Clarence Thomas's intellectual guru, and in time, a close personal friend. Sowell was an economics professor at UCLA, and he didn't just oppose affirmative action. He also spoke out against busing, raising the minimum wage, and welfare. 
In fact, most of the polls that I've seen of blacks put them, if you want to use this expression, uh, very well to the right of most intellectuals on most of these social issues. Sowell's positions weren't popular with civil rights activists, but they resonated with Clarence Thomas. Hearing conservatism from a black perspective made him more confident in his own beliefs. In 1980, he switched his party registration to Republican, just in time for that November's presidential election. Well, the time has come. You've seen the map. We've looked at the figures, and NBC News now makes its projection for the presidency. Reagan is our projected winner. Ronald Thomas's vote for Ronald Reagan made official what he'd been feeling for years. He wrote in his memoir, it was a giant step for a black man, but I believed it to be a logical one. Thomas couldn't have picked a better time to join up with the Republican Party. Reagan beat Democratic incumbent Jimmy Carter in a huge landslide. The GOP also won control of the Senate for the first time in nearly 30 years. We are seeing Thomas at the vanguard of the Reagan revolution. Just a week after Reagan wins the presidency, Thomas writes a memorandum for Danforth titled, We Have Power, Now What? We'll be back after a short break. The Supreme Court was designed to be above the fray. But right now, are the nine justices living up to that promise? On the new season of More Perfect, host Julia Longoria brings the highest court in the land down to earth. You'll meet people on all sides of crucial cases as she shares history that explains how we got here. More Perfect from WNYC Studios. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. San Francisco's Knob Hill is one of America's most exclusive neighborhoods, a glamorous enclave with panoramic views of the city and the bay. One of its landmarks is the Fairmont Hotel. The lobby is just glorious, filled with marble, and the furniture so plush and the carpet so thick. That's Juan Williams. These days, he's a columnist for The Hill and an analyst for Fox News. When he went to the Fairmont Hotel in 1980, he was a 26-year-old writer for The Washington Post. It was a really a special place. It was a, an edifice that would suggest to you that this was a cathedral of power. The young black journalist showed up at the Fairmont the month after Ronald Reagan got elected. He was there to cover the Black Alternatives Conference, a two-day meeting for America's leading black conservatives. His editor wondered if there might be a story there. She said to me that she was interested in understanding the whole notion of black conservatism as it was coming in support of Ronald Reagan because obviously most black Americans had not voted for Reagan. The numbers were stark. Only 14% of black voters went for Reagan versus 83% for Jimmy Carter. And this gathering in San Francisco made those numbers undeniable. I don't remember the lobby being filled with black people, by the way. This was very much, as I recall, mostly white. Those white attendees at the Black Alternatives Conference included top Reagan advisor Edwin Meese and the Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman. The way in which the blacks can improve their conditions is by fending for themselves, becoming responsible individually, and not by relying on the great white father in Washington. But the conference at the Fairmont Hotel was really a showcase for one man and his work. The moral regeneration of white people might be an interesting project, but I am not sure we have quite that much time to spare. <laughs> Clarence Thomas's friend and intellectual guiding light, Thomas Sowell. This is really an historic opportunity. Uh, the economic and social advancement of blacks in this country is still a great unfinished task. The Reagan administration wanted Sowell to join the president's cabinet. Juan Williams was courting him, too, to be the subject of a profile for the Washington Post. And so I was trying to use everybody to get to Sowell, but then Sowell was treating me like I was a, a nuisance. It was like I was an irritation to him. It was like I was a, you know, a, a fly buzzing around the great man's head. Frustrated by his inability to get close to Seoul, Williams looked for another story. He found one at his lunch table. 
you know, white tablecloths. And you can imagine great service at a fancy restaurant in San Francisco and being seated next to Clarence Thomas. Before this lunch, Williams didn't know who Clarence Thomas was. In 1980, not many people did. He was a low profile, 32 year old staffer in a junior senator's office. But Thomas Sowell had invited him to speak on a panel about education policy. That gave him the chance to mingle with a lot of influential people, like politicians, scholars, and journalists. What I remember is we're both in suits and ties, but it was his laugh and his mind was just fertile and uh, aggressive and active. Uh, and so willing to go into a discussion with a journalist in a way that other black conservatives at the Fairmont Conference couldn't match. You know what? I can't get to Seoul, but this guy's fascinating. Juan Williams had found his story, and the Post gave it some serious play. It got published on December 16th, 1980, at the center of the paper's op-ed page. The piece began this way. You've heard about Clarence Thomas, but not by name. He's one of the black people now on center stage in American politics. He's a Republican, a longtime supporter of Ronald Reagan, opposed to the minimum wage law, rent control, busing, and affirmative action. How a black man can say no to those policies is a mystery to most black people. Thomas had opened up to Williams, seemingly without regard for who he might offend. He criticized civil rights leaders like Jesse Jackson, saying they only saw black people as a monolith of poor downtrodden folk. He said that the worst experience of his life was going to school with white classmates who believed he was there only because of racial quotas. And he told Williams, if I ever went to work for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or did anything directly connected with blacks, my career would be irreparably ruined. Here is this young black Republican who says that if he takes any job that deals with race, it'll be like a monkey on his back, is what he said. That everyone's going to assume he got the job because he's black. That everyone's going to treat him like he's some affirmative action hire, you know, and that he just wants to be himself. And so here is sort of a human being saying, you know what, I am smart, capable, and I want to be seen for who I am and not just a black face. Williams's column introduced Clarence Thomas to a national audience, and Thomas made a very strong impression. In his memoir, he wrote that publicly opposing the liberal consensus on race made him an instant outcast among black staffers on Capitol Hill. But that wasn't the biggest controversy that the Washington Post story kicked up. It was about his sister and saying that, you know, his sister is waiting on by the mailbox for the mailman to deliver the welfare check. That was just the start. Thomas said his older sister, Emma May Martin, was dependent on welfare and that her kids feel entitled to the check too. They have no motivation for doing better or getting out of that situation. Thomas's views on welfare had been inspired by his grandfather, who found the whole concept of public assistance demeaning. Now, Thomas was telling the world that his older sister had betrayed the family's values. That, I think, especially among Black people, was seen as crossing a line. Like, man, you are holding your sister out and letting her get slammed, you know, while you're playing politics. Williams says the Post got inundated with calls and letters. Thomas thought he saw strangers glaring at him disapprovingly on the street. He'd been naive about the consequences of being so forthright with a reporter. It's not that Williams had misquoted him or mischaracterized what he'd said. It's that Thomas wasn't prepared for the blowback. You know, the response is strong, but Clarence Thomas won't return my calls. For six months, Juan Williams tried to get a follow-up interview. Finally, Thomas agreed to meet him for another lunch. It was right next to the White House at the old Ebbett Grill in Washington, D.C. And we were in a booth, and I remember that he was like, man, I can't believe what you did. I'm like, come on. You know, you had something to say, and I was a vehicle for saying it, and I think that, in fact, 
the things you had to say moved people. And, uh, and so we started talking again. Thomas's words made a mark inside the Beltway and on his own family. In his autobiography, Thomas said that he traveled down to Georgia to repair things with his sister. He had to grovel. That is the story in the Thomas household, yes, because his sister was infuriated. Armstrong Williams is a conservative political commentator. He's known Clarence Thomas for more than 40 years. And it took not just a few days, it may have taken months to heal those wounds. They were devastated. His family, brother. That's not how Emma Mae Martin remembers things. In an interview for the 2007 book, Supreme Discomfort, she said she couldn't recall her brother ever making a special trip to Georgia to apologize. That's Emma. Hey, Mama. Hi. Miss, Miss Martin? Yes. I met Emma Mae Martin a couple months ago when I stopped in to see her mother, Leola Williams, in Savannah. About 30 minutes into my conversation with Miss Leola, her daughter swept right through the house. I'm sorry to bother you and your mama. My name is Joel Anderson. I'm a reporter. I'm on my way out. What? <laughs> I'm in and out. Martin, who is now 76, was wearing a bright orange vest, and I don't think she ever stopped moving after she walked through the front door. You working? You got a vest on. Yeah, I work at, um, at the school. I'm a crossing guard. Okay. Mm-hmm. Huh? I'm out on my way out. Okay, nice to meet you, Miss Martin. Nice to meet you. All right, now. I didn't get a chance that day to ask Martin about her brother's comments, and she didn't respond to any of my interview requests. But it's worth remembering that Clarence Thomas had a whole slew of advantages that she didn't. After their childhood home burned down, Clarence and his brother moved in with their grandparents in Savannah and started going to private school. But nobody swooped in to save Emma May. She stayed behind in Pinpoint, where she went to underfunded schools. She was later abandoned by her husband and was left to take care of their children on her own. And she has acknowledged receiving public assistance for about eight years. His sister wasn't just on welfare, although if she had been, that would have been fine. Corey Robin again. She was also working multiple jobs at the same time and taking care of, like, the elders in the family and this whole extended family that she becomes a kind of matriarch towards. You know, Thomas and his brother, they left that world behind, not through anything they did. They got picked to leave it behind. And she was there trying to find every resource at her disposal to take care of that family. In their book, Supreme Discomfort, Kevin Merida and Michael Fletcher reported that Thomas's comments about his sister in welfare weren't some kind of one-off mistake. A co-worker in Savannah remembered Thomas saying he was disgusted that Martin received government aid. And years later, in conversations at the Supreme Court, Thomas would say that his sister ruined her life. You remember when there was that thing that happened in the Washington Post? When I visited with Leola Williams, I asked her to share her perspective on what happened between her children. Sitting next to her, I got the sense that Miss Leola empathized with her son and daughter and didn't want to pick sides. How, how bad was that for the family? It was kind of bad. But he was, was telling the truth, but she didn't want that, you know. That was between the family. The family is still back tight again? Oh, yeah. Did mm-hmm. it take a while? Um, well, it take a while because Claire's back off, you know. Didn't really come to see her. She is more lenient than I am. She don't carry grudge, you know, especially towards the family. She laugh it, laugh things off. I don't. Clarence Thomas's rift with his sister wasn't the only issue in his family life. In December 1980, about a week after the Juan Williams article got published, Thomas's wife, Kathy Ambush, took their son Jamal to visit her family for Christmas. Thomas stayed behind in D.C. and started drinking as soon as they left. Ambush didn't respond to our interview request, and from what we can tell, she hasn't ever really talked about her relationship with Thomas. But according to the book Strange Justice, one of the couple's problems was a mismatch of ambition. A former classmate of Thomas's also suggested that Ambush wasn't comfortable with Thomas's hard right turn. 
In the late 60s, Ambush had literally made Thomas lovesick. In early 1981, he moved out. Three years later, they were officially divorced. After that story in the Washington Post, it had seemed like Thomas's professional life was going to crumble too. But that's not what happened. Suddenly, he had a bunch of powerful fans. White conservatives in the Reagan administration said, wait a second, you know, there is a potential star here on civil rights issues that we could employ uh, to get our message out, to change the image of Ronald Reagan. Juan Williams's piece had infuriated a lot of people but the new presidential administration wasn't mad at all. Thomas was invited to join the Reagan transition team. They asked him to review the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. That was the same agency he just told Juan Williams he could never work for because his career would be ruined if he did any work that was directly connected with race. Nonetheless, Clarence Thomas accepted the assignment. And as it turned out, doing what the Republican establishment wanted wouldn't ruin his career, it would make it. Next time on Slow Burn, Clarence Thomas rises through the Republican ranks. The white conservatives, (laughs) they were amazing. They would come up to him and literally pat him on his back and tell him, we're so proud of you, man. But his workplace behavior threatens to derail everything. He would, you know, befriend certain women and, and then when he decided he wasn't interested in them anymore, he would sort of drop them like a hot potato. Slow Burn is produced by Sophie Summergrad, Sam Kim, Sophie Codner, and me, Joel Anderson. Josh Levine is the editorial director of Slow Burn. Derek John is our executive producer. This episode was edited by Josh Levine, Derek John, Sophie Summergrad, and Joel Meyer. Susan Matthews is Slate's executive editor. Merritt Jacob is our senior technical director. Our theme music was composed by Alexis Quadrado. Ivy Lee Simones did the cover art. We had production help from Patrick Fort, James Reddick, and Alyssa Midcalf. We couldn't make Slow Burn without support from our members, and I strongly encourage you to sign up for Slate Plus today. It's only $15 for your first three months. Head over to slate.com slash slow burn to join. You'll get all kinds of perks, including a member-exclusive episode of Slow Burn this week and every week. In this week's Plus episode, you'll hear more from Leah Wright Rigueur, author of The Loneliness of the Black Republican, including where Clarence Thomas falls among the different categories of Black Republicans. Slate Plus members also get ad-free listening on this show and all Slate shows, unlimited reading on the Slate site, and more. Again, go to slate.com slash slowburn to sign up today. If you're looking for breaking news analysis of everything going on with the Supreme Court right now, you should subscribe to Slate's legal podcast, Amicus, hosted by Dahlia Lithwick. Amicus has new episodes every Saturday this month to tell you all about the major decisions being released this SCOTUS term. And there'll be special episodes for Slate Plus members, too. Find Amicus wherever you listen. Special thanks to Michael Fletcher, Rachel Strom, and Slate's Mark Joseph Stern, Dahlia Lithwick, Christina Cotarucci, Evan Chung, Kelly Jones, Katie Shepard, Caitlin Schneider, Cleo Levin, Bill Carey, Seth Brown, Katie Rayford, Daisy Rosario, Janae Desmond Harris, Hillary Fry, and Alicia Montgomery, Slate's VP of Audio. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>